So if you don't know how to compose a picture with a normal still camera, then you know you you're kind of never going to be great with a with a movie camera or film camera. Hi everyone, welcome to Audio Academy. My name is Matt Harris, and today I'll be talking about documentary filmmaking and the best tips to get you started. Yeah, when you make any film, there's sort of three main stages, and it's the same with the documentary. You know, it's pre-production, production, and post-production. This film that I'm about to start on, uh, the middle of next month, is we're going to do about three weeks of pre-production. So during that phase, we're going to actually find the story, we're going to find the interviewees, find the subject, begin to write the actual narrative, and then we'll we'll sort of have enough kind of story context to create a script for a voiceover artist. Once we've done that. We then go into production, which will be about two weeks, and then we're going to be shooting interviews all over the country of those people that we found in, in pre-production. And after that, actually during that phase, what I'll probably do is each night take the sync of each interview, and I would just kind of get that ready and find the key elements that kind of tie in with the story that we're trying to tell, and, and sort of cut those up on a timeline. So we've got those each night ready for the next interview. So then when it comes to the actual post-production stage, which is the edit, putting it all together, I should be able to quickly find the interview kind of lines and quotes that will help tell that story. So it's because it's such a quick turnaround film, um, it's going to be really important to kind of have everything uh, ready to go by the time we sort of get to um, post-production edit, edit stage. This today, I really wanted to play around with light. I wanted it kind of quite dark over here. Uh, I've got a bit of a spot going on on my nose at the moment, so I thought I'd try and hide that. Um, and this is this is a, probably a kind of atmospheric style interview. Um, you know, you might use this for I don't know a crime thing or something. It's, you know, sort of quite emotional. Um, with Ron Boys, a lot of it was natural light on a, a couple of key lights, but just it's look, looking quite natural not probably not a stage like this is necessarily so it really does depend how you know how you're going to um it does depend on, on what the subject matter is and and the style really that you're trying to shoot for um so yeah there's there's no i can't say that there's one particular way that you should do it you just got to kind of look at the subject matter and then make that decision on on how to light it based on that really the kind of mood that you're going for look look at other documentaries like go online look at screenshots documentaries and just kind of build up mood boards and, and see if that actually fits with the story and the way that you want to tell that story. What kind of b-roll do I need to plan for during this stage? I already shot some of the b-roll for this um, and what I'll do is this film that we're doing is a lot of archive stuff so we'll be buying a lot of archive b-roll because it helps to tell the story a lot better. Um, I may use the drone, it depends on the location. Um, but otherwise it's mostly going to be archive and some stuff shot in a museum which I've already done in preparation for, for this film. With Ron Boys it was kind of five years of shooting b-roll every weekend of skaters and BMXers in the park because I knew that that would get me out of a lot of situations where I needed to get some really lovely stylish images and I shot a lot in slow motion um, so that I could easily kind of use that where we didn't have archive footage. Um, so you can kind of, like I said, I think already, you can never shoot enough B-roll. When I started on Ron Boys, I knew there was already a community of the past 40 years of BMXs and skateboarders that had gone to this skate park. So when I initially had this idea, I, f I figured that these are the guys who are going to be the champions of this film. You know, once the film's finished and complete, if it's good, then they're going to help promote it. So four years ago, just as I sort of started the actual filming, I, I set up social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, um, YouTube, to, to kind of start to build a relationship and try and get stories, get footage, you know, get them to send me pictures and everything. Um, and that really helped me to uh, find the people to interview, but also to build up a sort of a, a big database of people so that I could contact them. You know, I could, I could send messages and I'd get replies. 
Uh, and, and so when the film, you know, was finally due for release, I could just sort of send mail outs or post on social media. Um, and I think that really did help. Um, certainly one of the things that when the, when the film was finished, I had no idea about distribution. I knew it was, I knew it was a good, I thought it was a good film. And I reached out and managed to find a great distributor in America who kind of took it on um, and they loved the film. Um, and because of, I'd already built this community, I could say, well, look, there's already 10,000, you know, followers on Instagram that like it, they're messaging, blah, blah, blah. And so that is an appeal to distribution companies now. You know, they, you, you've instantly got uh, a niche group to market to. Uh, the distributors can kind of see that, you know, they're, 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 there's this community of people that want this kind of content. And the other thing that I did as well is a lot of distribution companies, now, unless, you know, unless you're a big studio with money behind you, you're going to be an independent filmmaker. You need, you know, as much kind of help as you can get. So I took on um, some PR agencies that specialize in working with independent film companies. And so they helped get me reviews before the film was released. So when it did come out, people could read reviews on film websites, um, cultural websites, and we, they got some great press. I've just started another campaign with another PR agency based here in the UK that are help pushing it for a film festival that it's, it's gonna be showing at um, this month. And they've got a whole bunch more reviews coming out, tying in with the Olympics and, uh, and you know, BMX and skateboarding. So I'm hoping that makes a difference. This is being shot now on a Sony FX9, which is fantastic. I think it's my, I mean, it's just great. The autofocus now on, on the Sony cameras is just game changing. Got this set to face priority, so I can kind of move in and out and it should kind of keep focus even in this uh, sort of low light condition. So I'm using that now as my sort of prime camera. Just got here a uh, Sony a7S III as well, which I use for B-roll and also putting on a gimbal, which I love. Um, Actually, I love that camera. The Sony A7S III is a fantastic camera. Lighting, I use aperture lights. I've got, so I'm using three at the moment. Um, but I also have to recommend, right, these aperture do these little lights. ALM9, I think they're DM ones. Now these are great, right? These are fantastic. I've used these. I'm using one at the moment to sort of highlight the A7S III. They just put out a great, bunch of light actually. Sometimes I work with sound guys, which is great because it takes that stress um, away from you of having to do that. But oftentimes you don't. So um, I'm always kind of shooting sound as well or recording sound as well. So I kind of use like here, you can't see, but I'm using a, an M416 uh, Sennheiser mic. Um, I'll also usually, I'm not today, but I'll use a lav as well. So I've got two sources of audio, that's kind of key. Um, my drone, as I sort of said earlier, these are brilliant and there's no reason why, you know, you kind of shouldn't have one of these now. They're fun um, and they're just really, really handy when you need some uh, really cool B-roll. One of the things I'll do is at the moment I'm recording this and I can see a big red light above the lens because I know it's recording. But what I do when I'm interviewing usually is I'll put a bit of black tape over that red light so then whoever is being interviewed, they don't actually know if they're being filmed or not, if I'm actually recording them. And that's great because that's often when you get the best bit. Another great bit of kit that I use is the um, X-Rite Color Checker Passport. These are great for color balancing when you've got two cameras. Um, also to kind of give you uh, a white balance on an 18 percent gray card. So if you're DP, you kind of know that you need these. Um, these just are great to have in a camera bag. I mean, one thing that I will kind of say is that I think the best sort of filmmakers and certainly, you know, sort of DPs and camera people are ones that come from a photography background. I mean, it's the reason it's called a DP, Director of Photography, because first and foremost, it's, um, you know, it's about photography. So if you don't know how to compose a picture with a normal still camera, then, you know, you, you're kind of never going to be great with a with a movie camera or film camera. So go out, you know, take pictures. I mean, I still love photography. My background is underwater photography. I spent sort of seven years taking underwater photos all around the world. I've taken thousands and tens of thousands of underwater photos. To me, the great documentaries are the ones that kind of shift story. You know, they kind of lead you down one direction and then something happens and everything changes. 
um, and, and it goes in a completely di different direction than you were expecting. But also the characters, you know, you have to have some great characters in. I recently watched a documentary about this big con that happened with the McDonald's lottery game, uh, Monopoly game, and uh, there's one key character in that who's the FBI agent, and he was brilliant. He was in the first episode, and you knew instantly. I mean, he was the reason that I kept watching, I think it was about three or four episodes, but he was the reason I kept watching the whole series because he was such a compelling character. And if you've got, you know, two or three of those, then I think you've got a great documentary. The problem with this documentary is it's, you know, it's completely unscripted. When you're working on a narrative film, you've got a script, you know what you're working to, and, you know, it very rarely changes. I mean, you know, bits and pieces may change, but when you're making a documentary, you know, you're just, you're throwing the whole thing up in the air and, and you know, things can kind of go wrong. Um, when I say go wrong, they can take too long, everything can take too long. Stories can go in completely the wrong direction. You'll spend probably a lot of time just trying to figure out the story. Um, I think if you plan, I'd plan, when I started with Ron Boys, I thought this will be a, you know, a six month project and then I'll, you know, six month production. And then with an edit, I'll have the whole thing finished in a year. But I realised after that first year that the story wasn't really going anywhere. It wasn't, it wasn't good enough. So I just had to keep going with it. Um, and also, the people, I, I sort of found more people. Every time I interviewed someone, they said, oh, you've got to go and see so-and-so, you've got to interview so-and-so, you know. He, he's fantastic. And then it was like I sort of opened up this wormhole of every time you interview someone, they suggested someone else. And they were also great. And so you know, eventually you have to kind of draw a line on it. And I think I drew the line around about 30 people or so. Um, but it wasn't It wasn't like I said, right, there's 30, that's it. It was just naturally, it kind of came to its conclusion there. Um, the, the thing that I did learn, what did I really learn that you should not do biggest mistake in that whole process? <sighs> I don't know really, biggest mistake. I don't think there was any mistakes other than the time, other than and underestimating how long it takes. Um, and that's going to be the key with this next film, this short, this film with an eight week turnaround, we've got an eight week deadline, so we've got to be really tight on how we shoot that. And it will be a completely different approach than I took to Ron Boys because we've really got to nail the questions and nail the script down. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the, the sort of key there. You know, I think when you're a filmmaker, you just kind of get your head in cameras and creativity and editing. You also need to, these days, you've got to also have a business brain as well. I mean, one of my sort of heroes and favorite directors is Ridley Scott. And if you ever read anything about Ridley Scott, it's like not only is he, you know, creatively brilliant, but he also is very business minded. He worked in the advertising world for years. He's, he's renowned for always finishing a film, you know, under budget and on time and and you know being very resourceful with with how he manages everything and i think you know you have to you have to kind of live in that world and have that same kind of mindset now that that really scott has for the much bigger pictures when i looked at making ron boys it's a film you know predominantly about skateboarding and bmxing and there hasn't really been a film about those from a british perspective the big American film, obviously, is Dogtown and Z-Boys, which came out in 2001. And every kind of film about skateboarding is sort of used as a benchmark, but they've all been very American um, focused. So, I mean, Dogtown is great, but what I wanted to do, I've watched that so many times. Um, and also like The Bones Brigade, which is another great skateboarding film. But what I really wanted to do was look at a different way of structuring a film um, that, that wasn't really so heavily focus around those two. So there's a great doc called Valley Uprising. I think it's on Netflix. And it's about mountain climbers in Yosemite. And I, and I saw when I saw that, I saw the real similarity between a skate park and the skaters and the characters in it to these guys climbing Yosemite and the characters of the climbers. And I really liked that. And I really liked the way that film was made. So to me, that, that became, I've watched that I probably, you know, eight, nine times, I guess. And that became a big influence on, on my approach to making Ron Boy, so that's really good. The Crash Reel, Lucy Walker's film, that's brilliant. I mean, that, that's a big influence to me as well. The Defiant Ones is a fantastic series on Netflix. I love the way 
they put that whole thing together. Um, it's great. I mean, I'd, I'd highly recommend watching that. So yeah, you can kind of check out the stuff that I do. I've got my own website, matt.film, Instagram, uh, at Matt Harris DP. Also check out Romboys. Um, I think, you know, if you're into BMX scene, actually not even if you're into BMX or skateboarding scene, it's more about people. The whole, the whole story is about characters and people and kind of the journeys that they've been on and gone on around this kind of skate park. And that's available on Amazon uh, Prime and Apple TV and Google and all, all the kind of TVOD stuff. Um, and it should be coming on a few more sort of places over the next few months. But check that out, Ron Boy's 40 Years of Rad. And yeah, and um, I hope that this was helpful and useful. Thank you.